Can everybody say hallelujah? Like you mean it, hallelujah. Man, I love that. Praise the Lord for what he's doing right now. Amen? Not for what we ought to talk about, for what he's doing right now. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. You know, I get the privilege to, to preach all across this country with Awake America 365. And one of the things I always say in my introductory is I'm tr we try to give the heart of Awake America 365, the reason we're doing what we're doing. And I always start out in the intro letting people know, you know, we know that America has gone in the wrong direction. Direction. We need, we know that America needs Jesus. And I'll always tell him, but one day God's going to open up the sky and his Holy Spirit's going to fall upon the church and the church is going to walk in signs and wonders. The church is going to be see miracles. The church is going to get out of the seats and into the streets. And one time I'm saying this probably about six months ago, about six months ago, I'm saying this and I heard the Lord so gently whisper in my ear. He said, you know, you got to stop saying that. And I'm like, what, Lord? And he said, it's already happening. And I was like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So I got in my car and I drove home and I'm just thinking about what he's saying. And I open the Bible and I start reading and the Lord brings me to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 1 and read this together. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said, Jesus, are you the coming one or do we wait for another? And Jesus said to them, go and tell the John the things which you hear and see, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And the, the Lord began to show me these things that I've seen, not in, the, not in like years ago, like I used to talk about things that happened in Africa years ago, but the things that I've been seeing just in these last couple of months. Do you know in about the last five months, I saw a blind man who could not read. He was 95% blind. He said that the blindness left his eyes like a mist and he could read right in front of me. I saw a little girl who could not hear enough to tell me if she could hear the gospel or not. I laid hands on her and I said, in the name of Jesus, deaf ear open. Her ears open. She received Jesus right then and there. I saw a little boy just a couple of weeks ago. Theo was with me. A little boy, 11 years old, got saved. Then he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. No one told him how to do it. No one coached him into speaking in tongues. He started speaking in tongues. And then he started prophesying an open vision that he saw. He said, I saw Jesus come down and stand right here like a bright, bright, shining light. And he had a sword of flames, a sword of flames in his hand. An 11-year-old boy. You know, over the last couple of years, I've seen churches that had never come to the altar. The altar is just something that only deep, deep sinners come to. So no one even wants to go to the altar. Forget going and praising and worshiping. But we would go back again. And they would be at the altar, raising their hands. And I'm like, what happened to this church? But it's happening. It's happening. And we, it was, it's happening. Okay, I got a call just yesterday. I got to share one more. Got a call just yesterday from a pastor. And he said, you know what? I'd love to have you guys back out, but you know, and we went there two years ago. He said, I'd love to have you guys back out, but you know what? I think I want to give my spot to another church that's really hurting. Because let me tell you something. Since you guys came, we have been out on the streets every week. Not monthly, every week. Our church is growing. Our prayer meetings are on fire. And we just got to notice, he said, we just got to notice that they're going to put us in the newspaper as being the best place of worship in the community. Everybody say, it's happening. There's a spirit of expectancy going on. And when there's a spirit of expectancy, the Lord moves every single time. Are you hungry? When you're hungry, the Lord moves every single time. The, it, the interesting thing about this passage, which I always thought was neat, is like, man, this is John the Baptist who was saying, Jesus, is this really you? Or should we wait for another? No one wanted to see, no one wanted to believe more than John the Baptist. He was waiting. He was saying, make straight the way. He was waiting. He was on the edge of his seat waiting. But he's the one that said, is it really him? Tell me, or should we wait for another? But John the Baptist, he was in prison when he asked this. He wasn't out in the mix seeing all the cool stuff happen. He was distracted by the four walls around him. Which brings me to the point of my message tonight. Are we going to sit back and listen to the cool stuff that Mexico talks about? 
or are we going to get out of our seats and into the streets and be a part of what's already happening? Amen? Turn in your Bibles. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read you a, a, an insert from a really cool book I'm reading about revival. It says, the whole point of revival is for the church to be awakened to the a reality, the presence, and the power of God. And for our hearts to be turned to him. We will see revival because it's a remnant of people who want Jesus more than anything else. One of the greatest tragedies that could ever occur is if the prayers of the saints who have gone before us, who have cried out rev for revival, Bible were wasted on a complacent church. Say, I don't want to waste this moment. I refuse to wait this waste this moment. All right, we're going to talk about three steps to jumping in to what's already happening. Write these steps down. Write them in the back of your Bible. There's three simple steps. All right, the first one, it's going to be the three R's to revival. Pastor always says three R's, so I wanted to say three R's. Three R's towards revival. The first R is probably the hardest of the three steps, repent. And I was so happy. You know, the Lord gave me this message a few months ago, or no, a few weeks ago. And then Pastor, a couple of weeks ago, started preaching on repentance every Thursday. And I was like, whew, well, should I still do it? And I'm like, yep, obviously the Lord wants the church to repent. So he plowed the hard ground, so I just get to walk easily and pick the fruit. That's what I'm planning on. But repentance, it's true. No one wants to look at ourselves and say, man, there's something wrong with me. No one likes to be pointed out that they're, that they're wrong. So that's why repentance is hard. It's not because some are better than you. It's because no one wants to say, man, there's something in here I got to get out. It's way easier to look at someone else's dirt. But there's two types of people in this room right now, and I'm in the same groups. The first group is people that know there's stuff in there that they got to get out. And they're willing to repent. The second group are the people that won't look at the stuff in their heart that they got to get out. But either way, we got to look at our junk and get it out because revival is going to happen. But it's got to start with repentance, period. We can't ask the Lord to fill us up if we're so full of ourselves. Amen? We can't ask the Lord, fill me up if I'm so full of myself. Amen. So we got to get that junk out. We got to walk in our purpose. All right, I'm going to read one more little thing from a book called Reaching the Unreached. It's a, an evangelism book. If you like reading, get it. It's a great book. It's powerful. It says, holiness unlocks doors of purpose in your life a lot faster than any seminar you could ever go to or any book you could ever read. But this is my favorite part. If you commit to a life of holiness, your purpose will hunt you down and lie at your feet like a dog. We ask, Lord, what's my purpose? What's my calling? What am I supposed to do? And the Lord's saying, listen, just repent, get your life right, and your purpose will hunt you down. Amen? I love it. So what's repentance look like? It looks like change. It's not coming up here to the altar and saying sorry and crying and going back and looking the same. It always looks like something. Amen? Repentance looks like something. All right, we're going to read Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 4. Sin can be sneaky. If we don't look for it, it can be sneaky and hide, us, hide from us. All right, starting in verse 4. Wait, I'm sorry, it went to Samuel. That's the next one. All right, starting in verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. Let's jump to verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off that old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Jump down to verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Verse 14. But above of all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Tonight I want to talk about sins of the heart. Sins of the heart that will prevent true, true revival just as much as addiction or cheating on your wife or your husband. Sins of the heart, they can be sneaky and can prevent us walking, walking in revival. Things like jealousy and envy. Wishing you had what they had. Getting hurt because someone else got praise or recognition that you didn't. Angerness or anger and bitterness unforgiveness, saying sorry with your lips, but nothing really changes next time you see them again. Malice, 
What is malice? It's spite, ill feelings, hatred towards another, and pride. Pride's refusing to acknowledge that any of this maybe even has anything to do with you. Pride is wishing that all the right people were in here tonight listening to this. Sins of the heart can be sneaky. They can be sneaky, and they're just not worth it. I have to ask. I always cry out, Lord, get this stuff out of my life. I can pinpoint something in my heart every single day. Why? Because I'm human. But I refuse to let it sit there and not acknowledge it. I'm going to get it out of my life. Amen? We have to search our heart. We have to search our heart. It's not worth it. Get that stuff out of your life. Amen? All right. We're going to get off of that subject, and we're going to turn to our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, now that I took my spot out of there. All right, we're going to talk about the second R towards revival. The second R towards revival, respond. The Lord is moving and we must respond. You know, when Tara came up, she was getting a word from the Lord. She was moving. If you still have pain in your body in those places that she was talking about, it's because you didn't respond. We got to respond when the Lord is moving. When he goes to throw something and you hear it a little bit, you see it's going to happen, it's your turn to move and catch that thing that he's throwing. Pastor Tony, give me your microphone for a second. <laughs> These are really expensive microphones, aren't they? Right? We hold on to them for a long time. You don't want me to drop this, right? All right, Stephen, stand up for a second. <laughs> give it to Stephen. <laughs> All right. I'm going to throw this microphone at you, okay? <laughs> it's off. Oh, throw pastor's mic. I'm going to tell him you said that. No, no. I'm going to throw this microphone at you, okay? But catch it because I want to keep a job, all right? All right. One, two, three. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to chance it. But did you see how Stephen responded? He waited. He, I told him I was going to throw it. He was expecting me to throw it. I didn't talk to him before service and tell him I was going to do that. But he got into a position. He responded. He made it a place to catch what I was going to throw. Amen? When we, when we come to church, we got to be ready for the Lord to move. When we come and we hear the worship, we got to get to this altar, lift our hands in the air. When the pastor's preaching, I don't care who he's preaching or what he's preaching about, we got to say amen. We got to clap our hands. We got to catch what the Lord is throwing. Amen? We got to respond. You know, Sunday morning, actually scratch that, Saturday night before I go to bed, I start telling the Lord, Lord, I want to receive whatever you have tomorrow morning. And I start praying as I go to sleep. Lord, I want to receive you. I know you got something for me tomorrow, God. I need it. And then Sunday morning when I wake up, I get on my knees. I don't care who's preaching. I pray for the pastor. Lord, touch him. Give him a word. And Lord, I know that word's going to be for me. I know it's going to be for the church, but I need to feel it, God. I need a word from you. And then I come to church and I get at the altar. I don't care if it's my favorite song, although I love the songs they were playing tonight. But I don't care if it's my favorite song or just a one note, one note on the key. I got my hands up in the air because I want to receive. I don't want to miss what he's throwing. I'm going to respond to the move of God. I'm not going to miss it. You know, I told Angelica, I was like, we're going to try something tonight. How do you believe that the Lord can move with just one key? You know, we was at this church in West Virginia, and Angelica was there. And it was a very hard church. It wasn't a church that just moves and gets excited all the time. Like, I love us. We're spoiled here. You have no idea. But it was such a hard church. And my I was crying out, me and the group, we were crying out, Lord, I want you to move. Lord, would you move tonight? Would you move tonight? And Josiah was with me. I was like, Josiah, just get up on the keys. I had no clue what I was doing. Just get up on the keys. Just play one note. I don't care what it is. And I told the crowd, I'm like, listen, the Lord is going to move, and it's up to you to respond tonight. And he just played one note, and the Holy Spirit fell. And there was a move over the Spirit in this place. We saw healings, salvations. The altar was full. It was beautiful. Because I told them what was about to happen, and they got into a position, and then they responded. Just play something. Let him come in right now. The Lord's going to move in this place right now. Just get in your place right here. Just... to your feet. 
feet. You don't have to come up. Stand to your feet. Respond. In the mighty name of Jesus, we respond to you. Your people are responding to you, Lord. Move in a mighty way in the name of Jesus. Do what only you can do, Lord. suffering with severe depression, not just a little bit, but severe depression. I just saw in my mind, I'm done, period. Maybe you wrote that, maybe you text that today, I'm done. I just want you to stand to your feet right now. The Lord's gonna touch you. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, spirit of depression, go right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, go. things are new. Receive it and walk in it. The depression is gone. It's just been lifted. It's gone. Now walk in it. There's at least one couple, maybe two couples that have gotten to a serious argument today. You're having communication issues. I'm not talking about divorce. Communication issues and you're here together tonight. Just hold hands and stand to your feet right now. No one's looking around. Just stand to your feet. Your healing is here right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, touch that marriage right now. Breathe a new spark of life in them right now, Father. Be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. If you felt the presence of the Lord and you feel him touching your body, I just want you to wave your hands in the air. Jesus, we respond to you, God. We respond to you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, God is a, the presence of God is such a beautiful thing, and we have access to it all the time. You don't need just a key played on the keyboard. You don't need a sermon to feel God's presence move. You just need to respond. He already wants to move. He already wants to heal. You just have to respond. All right, let's read. 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting in verse 4. Did I? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, everyone say it's happening. All right, the last R towards revival. The last R towards revival, turn to your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. You guys don't mind reading scripture, I know that. We are a church that loves reading scripture. Amen? All right, we're experiencing the power of God tonight. You know, I get so excited when I, when I read about Acts, the book of Acts, just like any other Christian does, because it's all about the power. It's all about how the uneducated and untrained men walk in signs and wonders, and you get all excited every time. You see 3,000 come to know the Lord in one day from one prayer meeting, a rushing mighty wind entering in. But here's the crazy thing, is we want the power of God. How many want the power of God? But it's not enough to just know what they did and get excited about th what they did, but we got to do what they did. Amen? All right, let's read Acts chapter 1 starting in verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, will it be at this time you'll restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. So basically the disciples were all getting around and they were asking Jesus, Jesus, when are you going to put an end to all this mess? Come on, Lord, it's too crazy. And if you got the power, put an end to it. 
pretty much what I ask every single time I turn on the news. But Jesus' answer was awesome. He said in a very polite way, that's none of your business. He said, that's the Father's business. But he said, you got one job, to win souls. The power of God is to reach the lost. Amen? It's not for us to get the goosebumps. It's not even for our healing. It's to reach the lost. Reach the lost where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. I love CCWC. We're all about the Great Commission. We're all about reaching the lost. Can we put this slide up? But when we look at the three areas where Jesus himself said we're supposed to witness, he said, for, well, it's Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judea, it's slide number one, not two. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So what's our Jerusalem? First, he said Jerusalem. That's the closest body of people. That's our families. That's our church. That's our Christmas production, our Easter production. That's our, our back-to-school bash that's coming up, or the VBS, or the high school ministry, uh, big summer camp. That's our Jerusalem. And then we have Judea. And that's our, our neighborhoods. That's our second Saturday outreaches. That's our street teams that are going on. That's when you go to the gym and you work out and you, and you, and you witness to the guy at the gym. And then there's the ends of the earth. Can we put the slide back on? And then there's the ends of the earth. And so how are we doing with the ends of the earth? Well, we had over 13 short-term missions trips to the ends of the earth last year. That's a lot. See, I can tell you're spoiled because you don't get that excited about 13 mission trips. I go to churches all year long that sometimes never have a one. And when they have one mission trip, the only one going is the pastor. I'll say, do you have missions here? Do you have short-term trips here? Yep, I'm going to India this week. As a matter of fact, the church is paying for it. I'm just kidding. No, but listen, it's, they got one missions trip. We have 13 trips. 75% of the people going on our, own, our trips have never went on a trip before. We have 10 to 13 missionaries, I don't know, we keep sending them out, that we support on a monthly basis. One of them, Destiny Maxwell, who's in the 1040 window. That's the, basically the gospel-free zone. It's very dangerous to witness there. So keep her in your prayers. She's where it's so dangerous to even speak the name of Jesus. But we send a missionary there. Ends of the earth. We have two unreached people groups that we adopted last year who are effectively reaching the gospel to places that's never heard the name of Jesus. That's exciting. That's really exciting. So we're doing really good in Jerusalem and Judea and the ends of the earth. But what about Samaria? What about Samaria? Somehow we went around Samaria. That's a little holy humor. Read it, get around to Samaria. Never mind. Read it. Okay. But where's Samaria? Okay, Samaria is the place where no one wants to go, where no one wants to preach. It's the outcast. It's the smelly ones, the hopeless ones, the people that, it, that no one wants to even spend the time with. As a matter of fact, and you can show the slide number two, the, that one, the Samaria slide with a map. In Samaria, they would go all the way around as far, miles and miles out of the way to keep from going through that place because no one wanted to talk to those people. When it would be easier to get from Jerusalem to Galilee, you could go straight forth. But they would go around. They would cross that sea of Galilee and come back all the way over to not reach Samaria. Samaria is that guy on the median that's holding the cardboard. And you pull up right beside him. You're like, really? I'm going to pull up right beside him? And then you're like changing the radio station. And you don't even have the radio on. <laughs> all of a sudden, you're like, I've got a call right now. It's I promise somebody's calling me. Hey, the people that no one, that you would do anything to not reach. But let's see what Jesus says about Samaria. Let's put the John chapter 3, 4. We're going to read it together on the screen. Let's read it together. Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. Not because it was easier but because everything in him knew that the Samarians needed to hear the gospel just as much as anyone else. Jesus loves Samaria. 
So why don't we love Samaria? Why do we skip Samaria? It's, we talk about all the other things that Jesus did. But why don't we need to get to Samaria? How come we'll spend $3,000 to go to the ends of the earth when we have Samaria in our backyard? All right, Angie, I'm not really following you. I didn't read John chapter 4 yet. Who are the Samarians? Who are our Samarians? I'm going to give you a few different clues to point out a Samarian. Samarians probably smell like weed. Well, Angie, this guy smells like weed next to me. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> it's okay. He's got a card for that, I'm sure. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Oh, wow. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm blushing a little bit. All right, Samaritans drink like fish and cuss like sailors. I don't even know if that's a real thing, if, cusser, if sailors really cuss. My mom always used to say that. But you never know, know what's going to, do they do? Okay, do they do? You never know what's going to come out of a Samaritan's mouth. They start talking, you're like, I can't believe they just said that. Well, they're Samarians. That's how they talk. You can't leave your purse alone with all Samaritans. Samaritans will come to church wasted, sometimes pass out on the front row. I know, I've picked them up and brought them to church. Samaritans may be attracted to the same sex, even questioning their own gender. Some may walk down US 19, waving their hand at cars to pass by. Oh, but she's just going to sell her body so she can get her next tie. Yep, that's right. She's a Samaritan. No one in Samaria looks like you. No one in Samaria will talk like you. And no one in Samaria will ever act like you. But Jesus had to go through Samaria. Jesus loves Samaria. And we must love Samaria. We have to love Samaria. Thank you, Jesus. You don't have to have it all together to reach Samaria. Sometimes people go, I don't know if I want to preach to that group of people because I'm afraid they're going to ask me a question I don't know the answer to. Well, let's just see how Jesus reached Samaria. Well, I won't read the whole thing because of time, but John chapter 4 will tell us how Jesus reaches Samaria. And we got to follow Jesus. What did he do? He went to Samaria. And then he sat down with the woman in Samaria. He got eye contact with the woman in Samaria. He didn't have to sit there and point out everything she was doing wrong. Let me tell you something about Samaria. They already know what they're doing wrong. Samaria already knows the mess they've made of their lives. What I love about Jesus, what he does things, Gosh, we should just really follow Jesus. But he sat down with her, and he told her how thirsty she was. She didn't know how thirsty she really was. And then he let her know that if she'd give him a try, she'd never go thirsty again. He said, if you would just drink from me. If you knew the love I have to give for you, then you wouldn't need all those other men. I can satisfy your every single need. How do you reach Samaria? You just love them. You just love them. You intentionally go to them. And you let them know how thirsty they are. The power of God. That's exactly what it's for. When Jesus said, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you so you can reach the lost, that's what he meant. You can't do it in your own flesh. I can't do it in my own flesh. It doesn't matter how hard I try. If I'm not prayed up and asking Jesus to touch these people, they will never feel his presence. And it might be a fake say the prayer with me, and then they'll walk away and need satisfaction somewhere else. But the power of God is to satisfy every thirst, to satisfy every need that we could ever have. That's what the power of God is. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to tell one little story, and then I'll close. 
I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm going to mess up and I'm going to get it wrong. But I will ask the Lord to help me not do it again. I think we all have to reevaluate our lives sometimes and find out, are we too busy? Are we too busy to reach Samaria? Are we too busy to reach the lost? So last Wednesday, I was really busy. <laughs> and I had $35 cash in my pocket because my husband starts giving me cash to go get dinner now because if I get a card, I'll find something else in the aisle. <laughs> so I was going to Winn-Dixie, and there was this girl on the side of the road with a cardboard. And I always give to the hungry, to the needy. I always do. I don't care where they spend it. That's not up to me. So I had $35, and I was like, Lord, my husband's waiting on me. I need to hurry up, get these ta this stuff for taco salad, and get home. And I was like, I really don't have time to talk to this woman. And I s saw her sitting there pitiful with a, with a cardboard box or cardboard thing. I said, I want to get back to Jersey. <laughs> you know that one. And so I just kept driving right by, ignored her, kept driving right by. I'm like, Lord, I only have $35. That's already not going to be enough. And I parked so far away so I wouldn't come face to face. I went around Samaria. And as I parked my car and I take the key out, the Lord said to me, do you really practice what you preach? And I was like, oh. All right, Lord, I'm going to go talk to her, but you know I don't have the money to give her. So I went up. I sat down with her. I talked to her. I just sat down on the curb with her like this. I was like, man, how would you get here? How would you get here? She's like, oh, well, I moved here from Jersey. I'm like, no, how would you get in this spot? Like, what's your story? And she said, you know, I was sold by my parents for $90 when I was nine years old. I was like, really, $90? And she said from that point on, she kept, she kept, that's how they got her high, and she was addicted to drugs. She just kept getting high, kept getting high. Long story short, that's how she got there. It wasn't like she sat in third grade dreaming up of the sky, just really hope that I can just sell my body for drugs one day. No, she had a story. And we're so quick to judge someone. Long story short, got my, I told her I didn't have anything to give her, but I gave her my phone number. And I went back to my car, and I had $5 left after taco salads. A miracle. It was like $29.98 that I spent, and I had $5 left. And I was like, Lord, do you want me to give her? I don't want to give this to her if she's just going to get high because she's kind of sober right now. Do you want me to give her this $5? And the Lord said to me, if you, gave the $5, if you give her the $5, she'll call you. And I was like, wow, good point. Okay. So I gave her the $5 and I said, here's my number. If you want to go to church, I'm telling you, you can meet Jesus. You'll never go thirsty again. And do you know, that was Wednesday. She texts me on Thursday. And she says to me, it was the most precious thing. She says to me, is it okay? Listen, I want you to know I'm not as dirty as I was yesterday. I found someone that I could take, I could, where, where I could take a shower. Is it okay if I still come to your church? I said, I can't wait for you to get here. And she says, well, well I said, well, I'll, I don't have time to pick you up now. Prayer's getting ready to start. I said, let me tell you where the church is. And she says, no, I'm already crossing the cemetery. I'm on Trouble Creek Road. I'm almost there. <laughs> she came to church. She got saved. And here's the cool thing. She already brought a friend. One of the homeless guys. 